So what I thought I'd do is bang out some ideas about what I was going to talk about tomorrow and then give me an idea how long it takes. I'd start by what I'm doing, why I'm doing it that way, and how I'm doing it. And that should probably be about 10 minutes. For what I'm doing, I've been making movies of lessons. So basically I'll pull out an outcome that I feel like my kids need to focus on or something that led from the last lesson I did. And I'll just let it sort of fester in my brain because there's a question sometimes with ownership and artwork. I've been waiting till my own time to do the artwork. Therefore it's mine. There's not a conflict of ownership. Okay. But I do take a little bit of my time to set up a camera before I start. So whatever I'm working on in the evening for my own practice, hmm. I'm taking a few minutes to just set up the camera in advance so that I can record what I've been working on. And if it turns into something I can use, then it turns into something I can use. And if it doesn't, that's just what I do anyway. So there's a half step of intrusion into my own life that I'm slowing things down a bit to work on my own stuff. That said, the next morning I'll take the footage that I had. I can take some time to dig into it, identify what needs to be cut, what's not necessary. They look pretty easygoing and kind of haphazard and sometimes I use the wrong word and I don't really worry about that too much because if I was teaching a lesson, I'd probably do the same thing. Mm -hmm. But I can cut usually almost about a one to five ratio the time down just by cutting out the word um. I use a Mac, uh, that's my comfort zone. Can do the same thing in a PC. Uh, I have all kinds of software, but I tend to just use iMovie. Recognize visually what my ums look like now, so they're pretty mm -hmm. easy, almost like a video game to just go through and, and hit play and I can hit pause, right, right. break, pause, break, delete, and then the ums are gone and I, I cut the movie down. There's several ways I make the movies. We're, I'll talk about some advantages. Because the course that I teach is visual communication, anytime I can do a video without any sound at all, is ideal. If I'm just modeling how I can work without speaking, I cut it, I separate the background noise, I drop the background noise out. It's really nice to drop some music in to make it more bearable. And then I speed it up. And actually you have to be careful about speeding it up too much because if, you, if, if the progress jumps and you don't see the progress, then it's unwatchable and useless. If the progress doesn't move quickly enough, you lose your viewer. So you don't want to be watching grass grow. You also don't want to be watching like a, a you know, flash explosion in your face. Mm -hmm. So finding that balance between what things you can speed up by, some parts I'll speed up by 200%, some parts I'll speed up by 150%, some parts I'll speed up by three or 4,000%. And just taking what the kids need to see out of it visually, which actually really improves my own process because I'm using my eyes to teach and not speaking so much. And in that sense, it's good to have a soundtrack. If you put a soundtrack on that's uh, got copyright ownership, well, there's an algorithm in the YouTube that will find your sound and hit you with a, a warning. So a couple of solutions I have is I'll either use the boring music that comes loaded with your iMovie, probably something in the uh, PC equivalent. I'll take a song that I really love and turn it backwards. That works better. Uh, the higher the quality of the recording, meaning like a really talented jazz drummer works perfectly backwards. Um, you know, Nickelback would sound like insanity backwards. So uh, my apologies to Nickelback fans. Yeah, I'll take, I'll take the sound and I'll speed it up, change the pitch, turn it backwards. And by the time it's unrecognizable, it have something just kind of pounding at your ears while the video's whipping by. Uh, sometimes it's super annoying, but there's a mute button. So if it's possible, I prefer, the quickest thing for me to do is just to speed it up, cut the sound out and hit, hit send. If it's something that requires more talking, usually what I'll do is I'll, like I said, I'll set the camera up and while I'm working, I'm talking, you get a real sense for how often you say um and uh and take deep breaths and you find out what a heavy breather you are. In that sense, I don't have any of the headache I would have trying to find music for it, but I do have a lot of fun going through and editing the next day, taking the important parts, cutting out the ums and the uhs and the buts and just crafting it down to the absolute shortest video possible. For my real life, if I'm shooting a video, it's always a 10 to 1 ratio. If you need 10 hours of, if you need an hour of video, you shoot 10 hours of uh, footage and you cut that down. Um, if I need, you know, as you get, since I'm working with myself, I can, I can estimate a little lower than that. I can go from a five hour of video to, to a, to a one hour, but that's because I, I know within my own head, the pieces that I'm cutting out before I shoot them, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. But whatever you have, you want to be cutthroat about deleting. You, you cut it down until you're starting to cut the good parts. And once you're cutting down the good parts, you have to watch that you don't, don't go too far and become something that you can't communicate. So if it's, if, if you take a thousand word essay, you drop it down to 1200 words, it's better. If you drop that down to 400 words, it's probably better. If you try and get down to 80 words, it's, 
gibberish. But, you know, whenever in journalism, if you write a, a story, they give you this 2,000 uh, word story. You got to take all the content and put it into 1,000 words and you need to put it into 400 words and then you need to put it into 75 words. And so by the time you cut down, no one can follow it and it's useless. But you want to be as close to useless as possible. <laughs> Why I'm doing it, I do it this way because if the kids are getting stressed out about math and social, if the kids are stressed about a pandemic, if the kids are stressed out about missing their friends, it's easier for me to take an entire day and make something that I can bullet down to 10 minutes of information and provide it to them to watch when they're ready. They're receiving it better. I've deleted, you know, what could have been six hours of, of babbling into 10 minutes of speaking. <laughs> They get the best of what I want to say. I think it's more fun to watch. And what I like is I, I get a, a rock solid sense of who's watching what. So I know that 70 people attended this class, 200 people attended that class. And uh, I'm combining my actual practice in a way that's actually benefiting my school teaching and actually my school teaching benefiting my actual practice. So I try not to feel uh, too guilty about working on it on my own time because it's pretty fun. That's, I think, the power of the videos that you're putting out is that they're authentic. You're not um, picking random things. You're you're plugging away at something. You're you're picking up where you left off with the kids in the classroom, and you're pushing for something. And like the authenticity of that comes across in your videos because it's, well, it's handy because you know I make enough artwork on my own time that I'm constantly drilling for what can I make next. Right to come up with a new idea. This has been a pretty great idea generator for my own practice because I'm like, oh, well, what, uh, you know, the kids could really benefit from a street scene right now. I'm actually inspired by what I think the kids need. And that comes back to the modeling that you were talking about when you did, your, you wrote a reflection about the, the time that affected your work um, and the responses back to your reflections have been really incredible because you modeled that. And I think you modeling the art making is also, um, has shown really um, effective to the kids too because they're seeing you making the artwork there's an opportunity to do detailed stuff that you wouldn't be able to present to the whole class right right like, like it's like that it... 20 kids that are closest to you mm -hmm. are getting a great lesson the other 15 kids mm -hmm. are kind of standing at the back of the room and they can't see what's going right. on right right so our class time when we were all in the building it ended up being a lot about doing and me trying to infuse the uh the lessons when i could yeah this gives me a little bit of time to to tackle some of the lessons that would be really difficult to present to everybody all right. at once. Uh, you know, I try and remember that teaching art's more like petting a cat than a dog, <laughs> right? You can chase them around and pin them down and uh, force, but really it's better if you wait until <laughs> they, come. they come see you. And if you ignore them, they'll come see you. But I No, would... you're like putting out the bowl of milk for them and letting them yeah. come to it. <laughs> um, it's been really well received. Uh, I try and do something new with each video. Uh, that's for my own sanity. So if I've if I've done a video that was a time speed lapse on one video, the next one I'm trying to do something that's more of an explanation. 